And we've been having calls with creators, with marketplaces, with analytics providers, just to run them through this approach and get feedback. All we're trying to do is is try and improve the standards and improve the trust and transparency in the industry. Like a GIA certification that came in with diamonds, where you know where they had, okay, let's like look at cut clarity, carrot and color. But that's a standard for the diamond industry. And that helped create at least some way of, 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 of figuring out what is scarce in, in the diamond market. So maybe we could start by trying to come up with an open methodology that we can all, that is public and that we can, you know, is, is, one, is one start. And then together as a community, we can figure out what the problems are and build it together and improve it together over time. Hey everyone, Kevin Rose here. Welcome back to another episode of Proof. I am stoked to have an episode today that is all about the open rarity score that OpenSea and others are rolling out. We're going to talk to one of the creators, Aaron, here, who is our VP of Engineering at Proof, and then also to Adil, who is product lead of the marketplace, and talk about all things NFT rarity and how this is a brand new score that is doing things in a unique math-driven way with something called information theory. So let's have a chat and talk about all things NFT rarity. Hey guys, welcome to the show. Thanks for having us. Yeah, great to be here. Yeah, this is going to be fun. This is a pretty big announcement, a uh, big new shift for OpenSea. So, Adil, I'd love to chat with or start off with you and just really go into the why behind this. Like, why introduce this type of uh, new methodology into the OpenSea marketplace? Yeah, so I think what we're talking about today is open rarity, which is uh, a, a, an open standard, an open and transparent standard for rarity in the NFT community. So I, I think I'll start off by talking a little bit about um, why OpenSea is working on this right now um, and some of the problems with rarity today, and then also a little bit of a history of the project and and, and how we all kind of started collaborating together on it. Sounds um, great. Yeah. So, so, you know, we at OpenSea wanted to integrate rarity into OpenSea in some way. It's the, you know, it's, it's in many marketplaces and tools out there, but we had no idea what provider to pick. Um, it was, they were really hard to evaluate because the methodologies aren't public and we, you know, we could come up with our own methodology, but we'd just be contributing to the problem by adding another standard. Um, and I think, uh, part of our part of our uh, ethos and things that we want to accomplish at OpenSea is how can we build more and more and more infrastructure and standards for the NFT industry and approach it from a community first perspective. So as we started doing research into um, rarity today, we realized there were a couple of concepts that were conflated in the industry. For example, we oftentimes conflate concepts of what is mathematical scarcity of attributes, and we call that rarity. Mm-hmm. Oftentimes, creators have a preference around. Uh, they think something is a cool trait or a cool feature or has some specific utility, like, you know, Moonbird hoodies, people can get a hoodie. And that's, you know, called more, is, is more rare because of that, that aspect. And then also, we often think of market value uh, for specific traits as, as rarity as well. And I think we're conflating all those three things. And as part of this initiative, we said, okay, how can we think of math- mathematical scarcity as rarity and, and try and come up, try and embrace that as the, as the as the place that we'll invest more as a team, uh, the other problem that we saw is that you know a lot of these rarity rankings are produced using closed source code. Um, they're divergent across all the different types of, of publishers that we see right now. So you can see rank of X in one place and rank of Y in another place for exactly the same item. And there's no single source of truth. And one of the things I think we'll get deeper into when when, when Aaron starts talking about the methodology is you know things like calculated traits, like the number of unique traits an item has, is, are used in some systems and, and not in others. And I think right. the last thing we saw is that many creators are often charged are often charged for including for for rarity as to include rarity as part of their collection. So um, some of the smaller creators really can't afford to pay uh, the cost for these rarity providers to get their rarity uh, to get rarity ranks included in their collection. Um, so as we looked at these three things, we realized there was an opportunity to to come up with a better standard. And so we started working on something and. During that process, um, two market insight tools, one it's called Curio Tools and the other is called IC Tools. They had already started working on a project earlier this year in February um, to solve exactly the same problem. And so they reached out to us and we decided to join forces um, to work on this problem together. And as you know, you know, we've been collaborating at OpenSea closely with Proof as part of all our trust and safety initi- initiatives. 
and thought it would be really cool to work on some more things together that would benefit the community. So Aaron and I got to chatting um, and, you know, realized that he was super smart and thought super deeply about a ton of different rarity pieces. And he's been a core contributor to our methodology ever since. So it's been great to have marketplaces, analytics, tools providers, and creators kind of represented as part of this journey uh, and all of us working together to solve the same problem. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I, I'm really curious when you all started thinking about this, like I, I like you as collectors, I've used a bunch of these tools, right? You go in there yeah. and it, it's really hard to determine because a lot of it's subjective, right? Like when you look at something and you're like, okay, take the classic. I remember back in the day um, when you get, if I first got into CryptoPunks, I, w- I was like, why are these hoodies trading for more than the average, even though they're, they're a more common attribute, but they're trading for a higher premium, right? And it was just because they had found a following, right? There was a yeah. community that said, I love this attribute. Like, this is more important to me than rarity. So it's not that price always tracks rarity, right? And sometimes some of the rarest things that I've seen, at least, and, and granted, I haven't used this new, this new methodology for ranking, but some of the rarest things that I've seen are not necessarily the visually like best things for me personally, uh, on some of these, uh, type of systems. And then to your point earlier about, um, rarity sometimes being applied to the number of attributes, which is a really interesting thing, because if you, uh, to go back to that historic example of crypto punks, like there's only one punk that has, I think it's eight attributes or something like that, like the most amount of attributes. So if you were using that type of scoring system, I would imagine that would probably score highest. Um, but I'd love to hear kind of, you know, what, what actually does this algorithm do? What, what doesn't it do? And what does it take into account? What, how does the math work behind the scenes? I Come guess on, Aaron, this that. is your, this is your, this, this is, is your, <laughs> I've been waiting for. This you. Um, so this is based on a type of maths called information theory, and it gets used for a lot of different things. When you hear the word bit in a computer. It's actually got a definition within information theory. It's used for like error correction, for communication, for compression. And these all seem like really strange, different things to be comparing and using together. But the one thing that they have in common is this idea of surprise. When you're trying to compress data, if the next thing to come along, it's very surprising. You can't compress it. You have to just put in what comes next. If it's not very surprising, it's easy. You can just say, 10 letter A's in a row, and it's Mm -hmm. easier to compress. So this this idea of surprise can actually be quantified. And I actually started this as a Twitter rant a few months ago, saying, how do we look at rarity better? I just had this idea dumped that this is probably possibly a way. So what we do is we take every trait and we look at its probability of occurring within the whole collection. So a one in 10,000 trait has a probability of, well, I shouldn't have done that, um, one one hundredth of a percent, um, and so on and so forth. And we convert it into this, uh, this surprise, this number of bits with an algorithm that actually does things that make it a bit more intuitive to work with. We then add all of them up and that gets us the score. We do a bit of normalization so you can compare between uh, different collections. But other than that, we don't actually change things. We don't change things for number of traits. We don't change anything else just because the, the properties of this, this information theoretic surprise actually hold quite nicely and they do what's intuitive for humans. Yeah. So it, when you came up with this, um, this little piece of, of code, this math, like, how do you, how do you test something like this? Like, I imagine you're not just going to roll this out on open sea without actually having it in a staging server and like kicking the tires and getting a lot of people looking at it and just saying, is there anything we missed here? What, what was the, 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 how did you take this from, from theory to actual code to, to now eventually production? Yeah, I, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, so, so our objective here is not just to have like, you know, at open sea, we want to have rarity on open sea. And what we're choosing to support is this open rarity methodology as opposed to picking one of the different methodologies out there. Mm-hmm. The advantage of this is that it is entirely open source. You know, and if next week we're going to be launching a website with all the folks that have contributed to the project and are endorsing the project, um, we'll have an open GitHub repository with all the math in there. So if you can just, if you could put the inputs in, you have the the calculation and then you can see the outputs. And we've been 
having calls with creators, with marketplaces, with um, analytics providers, just to run them through this approach and, and get feedback. And I think, you know, obviously, I think what we realize is this isn't a perfect solution or kind of a one score to rule them all. All we're trying to do is is trying to improve the standards and improve the trust and transparency in the industry. Uh, Aaron and I were talking a little bit about this, and the one like comp I could think of in my head is, you know, maybe this is similar to sort of like uh, like a GIA certification that came in with diamonds, where you know where they had okay, let's like look at cut clarity, uh, carrot and color or whatever that I can't remember what they are, but that's a standard that was started in the fifties for the diamond industry, and that helped. Per- create at least some way of, of 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 figuring out what is scarce in in the diamond market. So maybe we could start by trying to come up with an open methodology that we can all that is public and that we can, you know, is, is one is one start. And then together as a community, we can figure out what the problems are and build it together and improve it together over time. And I think if we get to that stage where, you know, we, we know there's going to be holes in this methodology. We know there's and we've made choices along the way that will you know, will work for some collections and may not work for others. So, it, and, and I'll, I'll come back to OpenSea, like the way we've decided to roll this out on OpenSea is Open Rarity is its, its own thing, its own standard. But creators get to choose whether they opt into showing rarity on OpenSea. Mm. So we don't turn it on by default. Creators say, okay, we think this makes sense. We can, t- we, we can choose to turn it on. And the only options we provide are open rarity or no rarity. Uh, and that's sort of how we've approached it, knowing that this isn't perfect and doesn't work for every single collection. And we believe the creator should have a choice in, in figuring out if it makes sense and if they should display it on their, on their, on their page. Um, Adil, I feel, I feel like you've, you've, you've thread the needle nicely here in that I, it's, a, it's a challenging thing because you have a bunch of collectors that, for better or worse, likely for worse, have relied upon some third-party rarity tools existing out there today and said, I have the number one of this. I have yeah. the number five of this or 233 of this, right? And in their head, that's kind of, that's, that's been entrenched and that's like the, their belief of what they own. In some sense, as a product person, when I think about what you're doing here, it's brilliant because you have you have the power to really piss off a lot of people here if you were just to blanket roll this out right because it, the, you you mess with their bags and, and you say that this is now you know dropping you know 50 points in rarity or whatever it may be um that that's going to upset some folks so you're putting that that power back in the hands of the projects which is really interesting um yeah that's that's pretty cool i, I would imagine that given that this is publicly available, even if a project doesn't turn it on, nothing is to prevent a developer from creating a Chrome extension that would turn it on for me. And I could just browse any collection with this new open standard. Is that correct? Totally. And I think part of, you know, we at OpenSea have made the choice to only display it for uh, creators who choose to turn it on. But we're we're also going to build our API such that we pass through that flag. So if creators have turned it on or opted out, Third parties can also pull that information and then show on their side, say, the creator's turned this off and hasn't endorsed the score. But if you want to see the score and they choose to show that score, they can show that score. So I think what we're trying to do is both provide the information on site, but also provide developers with the, the opportunity to, to, to use that information outside of our product as well. That's and, great. And I think you, you raised like a really good point, right? Like the biggest risk of doing something like this without picking something that already, already exists is divergence with existing scores. And in, in a, in a, in a fit, you know, it's a zero sum game. It's just rank, right? This, things are just ranked. And so some people's ranks are going to go up and some people's ranks are going to go down for their items. But it hurts much more when the rank goes down for your item than when it goes up. And right. I, think, I think that's the thing that whenever you come up with some sort of like new standard is, is really hard, right? It's really hard for collectors. It's hard for creators to figure out which, they should, which standard they should endorse. And I think it's easiest for new projects, right? Because for new projects, they can just be like, okay, I can use this methodology. I know how it's going to appear on OpenSea if I choose to turn it on. And, and then it's, it's fully transparent. I and mean, all the problems we've seen in the past don't apply to new projects. It's the existing projects that have kind of, people have predeterminations in their mind about what, what is the right rank um, for specific items where this becomes a little bit more nuanced. Really curious, have you all, well, two questions. Uh, I guess one we haven't tackled yet is is what actually is displayed? Is it a zero to 100 score? Is it a descending list of, of, of rank? Like how is this going to work? We output a score as part of the methodology. And then at OpenSea, what we'll choose to do is just display the rank um, in the collection. So mm. um, that's just what we're going to do. But in our API, we'll provide both the rank and the score. 
Um, and then developers can choose how they want to display the information on their site. But the output of the, the, actual, um, the actual code is a score. Aaron, I don't know if they have anything more to add there. Yeah, the score is just, it's something that doesn't make as much sense if you just look at a number. It's, it doesn't have a, it's not a percentage or something like that. So the rank makes a lot more sense for an end user. And, and then uh, can there be ties in this world? Yep. If you have uh, one thing turns, like if you have two tokens, say each only have one trait, one trait turns up 25% of tokens. The other one has a completely different trait that's also in 25% of tokens. They'll both get a score. Gotcha. And the score will be identical. And, and yeah, the product choice we've made on OpenSea there is we'll display the lowest rank, but we'll have an, a visual indicator to show when it is tied with something else. Gotcha. Yeah. I'm curious when you look at some of the, and this is probably at least that I've used in the past, probably three or four other tools out there that do, you know, some type of score around this. Um, how much, and you've played, if you've played with this on a, t a testing server, have you done a kind of compare and contrast between your ranks and others? And then how much do, um, would you say there's, uh, differences between the two? Like, is there, are there wild swings or is it like along the same lines, but things shift around a, 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 a tiny bit? So I think one of the starting points for this piece of work was actually to look at a bunch of this, the, the methodologies that exist out there and the different tools and say, okay, like. Are they roughly the same right now with e within each other, or are mm -hmm. they divergent? And when we did that analysis, I think I think we picked like twenty five or thirty collections with like different you know types of projects, different PFP projects, different other types of projects, and and so there was already pretty big divergence. And as we were you know evaluating different methodologies, information content, which is the one we ended up picking, you know arithmetic mean, geometric mean, all the different like ways we could approach this. Um, one of the factors we looked at is you know how divergent is this and um, and you know the, the methodology we ended up picking, even though we think it's it's mathematically the most sound, it it does have divergence, and it's hard for us to quantify how divergent it is on and you know at, a, at an item level. But we will see swings. The, the kind of most nuanced one is people are going to find like an item where it kind of doesn't. It, for, you know, as a user, you look at it and say, like, "Oh, why is this ranked X?" It doesn't make any like, int like intuitive sense, but the math the math says it should be ranked X. And I think doing a side-by-side -side comparison, you'll find a bunch of exceptions if you do that just naturally. So we, again, as we said, we realize this isn't a perfect solution. It's a starting point. And we hope to iterate with the community together to, to build this up. And, and I think creators are going to have really, really, really interesting viewpoints of the details, especially new projects that are using this as they're kind of coming up with their metadata uh, and there's their defining traits. They're going to have like really interesting pieces of feedback. And it's the kind of thing that needs a bit of time in the, to marinate in the industry before we realize what all the best things, what, what all the flaws are and what all the positives are as well. I'm curious when you, when you mentioned this idea, uh, and it's the only way to go, obviously, of having it open, transparent, um, you know, a, a handful of collaborators from, from different industries. So it's not like this is just an open C run piece of code behind the scenes. Um, that all makes sense. How much modification do you see going forward happening to this code? Like, obviously you're launching something that you think is the best version of itself. Um, yep. Are there realistically a lot of like real true input that could come in from the community that could help you make changes to this? Or is it, you know, are you, are you, are, I just, I'm curious, like, is it something that's going to shift on us six months from now? We're like, oh, they updated it to 1.1 and now the ranking is completely different now. Or are there small little tiny tweaks that we don't, you would imagine would come into it? Or you just think this might be good enough and you'll probably never see any tweaks? A lot of the things, like if you look at Moonbirds, for example, all of the traits are what you'd call categorical. They don't have a number assigned to them. And that makes it really easy to just chuck them in a bucket, count how many are in the bucket, divide by how many in the whole collection, and we get a probability from that. With that is a fairly standard way of calculating probabilities, fairly standard input into information content. It's unless people were to push back on the, the methodology as a whole, there's not much more that you could do around that. Numeric traits become something a bit more interesting and different. Like for example, the, the canonical example we always use is strength of an of a character in a game. Like loot, so, for example, would be a great project that has a lot of numeric traits. Yeah. So if you've got, if you have strength, which is something that is, it's got an order to it, but you just count how many are in a bucket, it doesn't necessarily make sense all the time. Mm. You may have a three out of 10 strength, but you're the only character in the whole universe that has this really low score. So something like that, you do you really want the thing that's scarcest in that respect? But 
it, sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. So you right. have to look at like, what, how do we ca- take into account ordering? What input do we get from the creator? Does order matter? Which order matters? Like, are we playing golf or are we in a wrestling match? So things like that. And that's where we're probably where we're going to need a bit more input. Just yeah, I mean, it might not even apply at, at that point though, right? Because it's, it, I feel like in, for the loot example, like you'd have to go attribute by attribute and understand is a higher score better or is a lower score bit better, right? And then there's weird stuff like, you know, certain magic robes have an order of magnitude better effect in certain games and like how you gonna, how you going to factor that into like the actual score. So I'd imagine there's just a world where there's a handful of projects that, that this isn't even applicable to. Would you say that's probably true? Yeah, so, and, awesome. I, in, in that, and that's even in just in the PFP world or the, the gaming world, but there's also fine art projects or photography pro- projects where like rarity doesn't make any sense really. Right. Like attribute-based rarity makes no sense. I think th- there's also like a couple of other, like, you know, I think as we think about this more and more, there's also opportunities to improve the metadata standards. For example, here's like a, a very practical example for a game. Let's say I have the, I don't know, mythical... Uh, emerald sword, and then I have the um, emerald um, armor and then um, an emerald hat. And the, when I have all three together, my character gets like a 50% boost in power from all those things. It's hard to capture that in, in the NFT or with the current metadata standards or in this kind of rarity calculation. So the concept of sets and sets being more important than other sets or more rare than other sets or more powerful, it's really hard for us to, to, to include that in this kind of thing. So we've started simple. And again, like over time, I think the intersection of like the improving the metadata and how we how we display and calculate and show metadata and how that impacts kind of the rarity, the open rarity calculation on top of that is kind of an iterative process. And I think yeah. a lot of new projects are going to end up doing really cool things to help improve this. Well, I mean, a lot of new projects are, are just going to incorporate this score before they launch, right? Like they'll yep. bake it into their creation process and they'll totally. be able to go and look through everything. And that was like, I remember when we were doing Moonbirds, um, the, the day before, well, two days before we went live, uh, you know, we're, we're spitting out these 10,000 K, these 10 K collections and we're telling the the computer to go and we, we have values and spreadsheets that are being pulled from and, you know, it's assembling them and, and, and kind of creating the collections for us to, to comb through and make sure there aren't any crazy problems. Um, it literally like <laughs> I was on a call with, I, I brought Derek, one of our advisors on and I was like, okay, Derek, like, what do you think? He's like, oh, there's too many of this hat or this, this here. And we're just like, just guessing, you know, where it's like literally like, well, let's dial that bit back by like a half a, a point or whatever, and then rerun it and see what it spits out, you know? So there was like no, there's no solid methodology there to go and say, um, how can we score this stuff and view it in a way that, that makes sense pre-launch, which is, this is going to be, this is going to change everything in terms of the creation process, which is pretty exciting. That's really cool. I'm actually curious how, how, how you approach kind of rarity in general, uh, when you, when you all came up with Moonbirds and you were going through that is, and how did you think of, how did you think about working with all these different existing providers out there right now? I think that'd be really useful to to hear. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, happy to walk through that. I, there were certain, I honestly, it's a, as much as people, I don't know if people believe this, but there's no science here at all. It's, it's, it's a lot of love of what you like, you know, and there were certain attributes that, um, we looked at and said that could be a really popular attribute and something that a lot of people are drawn to. Um, we want to make sure that it hits that sweet spot of, uh, not too many, but not too few, right? If there's too few, it won't be broadly collected and won't create any type of like following behind it. I think the, a, a great example of this is kind of what we thought about the hoodie attribute with um, CryptoPunks, right? It was something that was this middle of the road and it, it carries a high value because it has a following, right? So we were, how many of these attributes can we create these little micro followings out of? And then when we thought about um, kind of the special hand assembled NFTs where they had a very like the glitch characters or some of the gold ones or ones that we just knew had to be pixel perfect. So we didn't want to leave it up to chance and we just wanted to manually build these. And, and, you know, those we probably did, I don't know, there's a, at least a couple hundred that were kind of manually built that went into the collection that were the ultra scarce, like it visually you could tell, wow, I have something special here when you look at it, right? Like it really stands apart from everything else. And so that was a piece as well. Um, but it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was just a, 
it's funny enough. It, it's just a, a handful of people sitting in a room making these decisions. You know, it's like, there's no special magic here. Uh, we certainly could have used a tool like this uh, going into it that would have aided a lot in just having a, almost like treating it like an extra uh, seat at the table in terms of giving input on what, what is rare and what is not. Right. So that yeah, that's super, that's oh, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. That. And that that was that's super cool to hear. And I and I think the way I've, I've always I've always thought about it, as a collector myself, you know, my mood bird has a hoodie, so um, I've always been like, you know, and then you know, I, you know, you, you all you all announced that you know potentially Moonbird hoodie folks would get a hoodie, and so oh, there's, there's, just wait, there's hidden. <laughs> I'm excited. Um, there's there's a lot of hidden nuance here, right? I didn't know that all the gold ones were hand were hand drawn, for example, or hand created. Um, you don't. There's a lot of nuance that can't be captured in a in a object in, in kind of a mathematical score of scarcity. And I think, as as I think about it as a as a collector myself. This is just one input that you need to use as you're researching to figure That's out right. what to buy. It's just like you have to think about the aesthetics and what speaks to you. you That's to right. Think about what you know. I know you like the Zelda, the Zelda ones because you 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 play a lot of Zelda, and I think that's another interesting. We, we can't thing call it the Zelda, by the that. way. That's called the hero attribute. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, the hero attribute. <laughs> My bad. Um, and I think it, it's it's the hero attribute is something that you know speaks to you. And I think this is the kind of thing where this is just a small, this is a input into making the buying decision or, or, or selling decision or whatever. And I think we have to recognize that we can't just like rely on these scores for everything. Oh, for There's sure. So much nuance here. And, and people who get really into these projects really understand that nuance, I think. Yeah, I think that Adil, that's a great, it's a great point because when I think about um, the collectors that I interact with, you know, it, it's rarity scores fun to look at, but it ultimately visually and momentum around attributes trumps all else, right? Like if there's a, some that has struck a cultural chord and has really landed on a population of something being really important to a collection that trumps a lot of, a lot of scarcity uh, pieces, right? The other thing too, is there's odd, these odd little groups that get together and they 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 just find the the funniest things to latch on to right like with the chromie squiggles uh group um you know which i'm obviously a fan of they have ones that are that are the ghost attribute which is like you know you you really most of it's hidden in the background because it blends in with the with the colors right and there's even the one other thing that a lot of people collect which they call it day one um squiggles so it was squiggles only that were minted on the first day so they went in and looked at the smart contract and said, what is the cutoff number for day one squigs? And those carry an additional value, like a little bit of a boost on top of that. That's something you never would have captured in, in one of these scores, right? But it's, yeah, totally. it is becoming a thing. And so it just goes to show that, that this is, yeah, this is just like one little tool, which is fantastic to have. If a creator just sees that little groups are forming around these things that are there, but aren't captured in the metadata, they can update the metadata it's not lying. It's, it's something that they just hadn't actually stated before. It's been there the whole time. And then the scores can just be updated and then start capturing that to understand this kind of collector sentiment. What about when that's already been finalized in the chain though? Like it's, it's done, like they can't pu push any new attributes so, out. Metadata is generally off chain. Yeah. That's interesting. Cause I should talk to Snowfro about that. Cause there's a handful of things that, I mean, if I could just sort by, you know, the ghost squigs uh, or day one squigs, that would be such a cool thing to have in OpenSea. I have to imagine that that's a request you all get at OpenSea in terms of like collectors having something that they really want to see the data sliced and diced this way, but it's not in the metadata. Is that is that fair to say that happens? Yeah, it's totally fair to say. And I think I think we'll see, I think we're going to see metadata like evolve over time. Like if you think about it, some metadata should be frozen. Like whether or not you're a human is frozen, but whether or not your your specific power grows over time, and as you know, as gaming becomes more popular and NFTs and gaming mm -hmm. become more popular, I imagine we'll have a set of frozen traits and a set of mutable traits that are changing all the time depending on what you're doing in the game. So I, I and I said these, this concept of sets where you know black hat, black shirt, black pants are like you know worth are are, are you know more rare because they're part of a set is like something that's also pretty interesting. And so I imagine that this intersection of 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 traits and improving them over time will be, and, and how it how it how it impacts the kind of open rarity metric is something that's going to be really interesting to see how the community um, embraces it and and I think a lot of the the impetus and the control for that is in the creators' hands. The creators get to pick 
how they adjust the metadata and how and and they'll know how that impacts something like open rarity because it it is open and they can run they can run that through it if they want to yeah and so we're excited to see what happens there that's awesome so uh give us a timeline here what's the what's the rollout look like and and you said they're going to opt in well i guess t- t- two questions how many folks have already that if you've spoken to have already opted in collection wise have any of the bigs can you go out and say like obviously we're going to do it at moonbirds but have you have you said um, you know anything like uh, if Board Apes, for example, have they opted into this? Um, any of the other big collections? Have you have you spoken to them yet? We ha- so we are in the process of speaking to all these folks. Um, I don't have the finalized list with me with me right now, but um, early next week or mid next week, at some point, we're going to do a kind of launch of the Open Rarity website and all the launch partners, which include marketplaces. And we have like you know lots of marketplaces are opting in and 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 uh, supporting the project. Cool. So there's other marketplaces that are going to be on board. This is not just an open sea thing. Like many many marketplaces are. Gonna oh, fantastic! This. Yeah, it's like, you're not going to do the same day as the merge, are you? Oh shoot, we should look and figure out. What <laughs> uh, let me check into that. I hope we don't we don't have a schedule. Yeah, I was going to say this sounds like it's right around the same time. Yeah. Okay. Let's. We'll make sure that we don't do that. Um, but at some point next week, we're going to launch the kind of Open Rarity website and um, and the launch partners, and then I think a week after that, um, uh, a, the bunch of the the kind of core contributors, IC Tools, Curio, and us are all going to launch on the same day, open rarity on the same day. And then a bunch of the other partners that we've been working with, they, they're working on their own schedules to figure out when it makes sense for them to launch. So um, I, I think everyone can integrate it whenever they, it makes sense for them. But um, yeah, it's sort of in the next few weeks, we should see this all coming live on OpenSea and uh, all, the, all the launch partners and the methodology being public next week at some point. But we'll make sure it doesn't uh, coincide with the merge. <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. I'm excited. I'm excited to get that Chrome extension that some one of these listeners is going to build that that yeah. will give me instant access to all the collections. <laughs> you know that has to be coming with a quickness, right? Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Awesome. Well, this has been great. Um, Aaron, anything to add uh, technically that you'd want to mention or was this a pretty pretty good summary? Um, I can give an explanation like if you want for how things work in a little bit more detail. Yeah, please. So probabilities just aren't intuitive to humans. They don't work in ways that we naturally like to play around with numbers. You can't take an average of a probability in the way that you would take an average with something else. If something happens in 10% of cases versus 1% of cases, being 10 times rarer, just finding the middle, like banging in the middle, isn't the correct way of doing things. It doesn't stand up to mathematical scrutiny. So what we do is we we transform these probabilities into a, a set of numbers that actually allow you to do the things that are intuitive. You could add them together. You could take the average. You can find a midpoint between them. And the, the main thing that goes wrong when you work with probabilities is things can get infinitely and infinitesimally more rare. You can have like one in 10, one in 100, one in 1,000, one in 10,000. But those things, like if you look at them, they actually get closer and closer and closer together. And so the difference, even though each one is just 10 times rarer than the one before, the gap between them is smaller and smaller and smaller. So by changing into this world of surprise, which for the nerds out there, it's just the logarithm, it takes that like squishing effect and it makes it into a linear thing. So Mm -hmm. every time you go down like one-tenth the rarity, one-tenth of that, one-tenth of that forever, you still get more and more points and you get the same number of extra rarity points every single time. And then you, it's fair to take the, the average of all of those. And like you were talking earlier on about a punk that only has eight, it's the only punk that has eight traits to it. Mm-hmm. We don't take that into account explicitly because it just kind of works itself out in the wash. There's got to be some other trait. Like we, what we do is we assume that if you don't have a trait, you have it, but it's the null trait. So if, like looking at Moonbirds, for example, if you look at cosmics, so only I think three in 10,000 have cosmics. So everything else has a 99.97% chance of having not that trait. And that just adds up and it just, everything works out. So that punk with eight attributes will get attributed the correct amount of scarcity and rarity hmm. that it deserves. But in a way that doesn't just arbitrarily say, how many traits are there? Because a, collect- a creator, sorry, can actually just stuff their, their collection. They can just 
put a million different traits in just to like make it look, hey, look how rare my, my NFTs are. And so we actually collect, correct for that as well in doing yeah. this, which allows between collections, you can actually compare them as well. That's, that's fantastic. Um, do you imagine, I'm really curious to see this list of launch partners of who's going to be turned on. Do you have, are you saving that for the actual date or do you have any that like, like, have you, have you talked to art blocks about this? Are they going to blanket? Do you imagine something like an art blocks would turn it on blanket for every project or are they going to ask each individual contributor? Do you have any sense of that? We have talked to art blocks actually there, there, I, I don't want to speak because these things change <laughs> over time, but my understanding is they're like. Uh, pretty supportive of the methodology and the and the problem we're trying to solve. I, but I don't know the implementation details of of how they're planning to roll it out. Um, it's yeah. very exciting. We should turn it on for proof collective as well. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> let's let's see where that where that nets out. I was just going to say one more thing. I think one of the things that we we talked a lot about um, is you know this approach we've chosen is 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 more in, in our minds more mathematically sound. But it is harder to explain, right? It's harder to explain a linear calculation uh, and logarithmic calculation versus like linear math, right? So it's one of the things we thought about as we as we as we built. And I think, you know, Aaron's done a great job of explaining how the complex math works. And it's just it's but it's I think over time, like if it's harder to explain, but also more transparent and more open and anyone can look at it, we I think we can solve a lot of those problems over time. So picking the simplest one just because um, it's the simplest was something we wanted to avoid as part of this, um, because we thought this was a, a math, mathematically more sound approach. Yeah. Fantastic. You know, Adele, I'm, I'm curious as a proof collective member and a Moonbirds holder, if you put your collecting hat on for just a second, I like to ask this of, of my collecting guests, you know, you see a lot at open sea, obviously you see everything it's, it's coming through, it's hitting the marketplace. What, what is a collector, if you can take off the open sea hat for a minute, uh, you know, what do you, what are you drawn to? What do you like given that, that you're in the front and center of everything going on? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I found myself as a collector, like not buying and selling that much these days and really going super, super deep into specific communities and projects and trying to learn about them. So um, the the NFT I most recently bought was a doodle. Uh, I just like really excited about what they're doing in the community. I think they they built a really good team. Everyone just seems really nice in the community when I went there and started talking to folks. Um, and then I spent a lot of time using all the different tools out there and waiting for the right one to buy. And then I finally bought one last, last week. So um, I really like what they're up to. And then I, I'm really fascinated by nouns. I think nouns is a a super interesting project, um, and uh, it's one it's one of the most interesting ones that that's out there given the size of their treasury. I'm interested to see what they'll do with it, but it's something that I, I I'm I'm with a few friends. We may we may end up um, getting one soon. Uh, it's something we're thinking carefully about. Yeah, I, I agree with you in terms of just like sitting back. You know, I this space is so fresh and so new. Um, I love experimentation. I'm drawn to that. Like, uh, and, and this is like nouns, I would say is probably the one where you just sit back with a popcorn and say, okay, cool. Let's see what happens. You know, you just like, it, 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 they have that, that, um, that mixture of, of different directions, uh, that you just don't see in any other project, you know? And, and I just, I love that. And, and I don't know how value will accrue, but yeah, it's it's fascinating, right? Because it's 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 just a, a one big experiment on on multiple levels, which is is going to be fun to watch unfold. I've been now curious myself, but it's yeah. it's it's a big amount of ETH to commit. It is um, yeah. not to say you couldn't get it back out, but like you know, I I'd have to see find one that really spoke to me, and hopefully find it on a, a off day where I can get it at a reasonable price. But um, <laughs> yeah. Well, fantastic. This has been great to, to have you both on. Um, very much looking forward to seeing this launch. And um, yeah, thanks for explaining everything and, and putting this initiative together. It's, it's much needed. Thank you for having us. It's been great to chat. Thanks, Kevin. All right, that is it for this episode. Thanks so much for tuning in. If you would like to help us out, head on over to proof.xyz and click on the reviews button at the very top and leave us a five-star review. Thanks so much. Take care. Oh,